All right, hey folks, um, this is Les here, um, also known as Sixus One, with uh, the first of our DAS Studio Teachables from Sixus One. And uh, joining me for these is uh, my longtime friend, uh, Mr. Brent Bowers, also known in the community out there as Graybro, um, throughout the Poser and DAS community. And uh, just a little introduction: what these are, the DAS Studio Teachables that we're doing, are going to be quick videos typically about 10 minutes in length where we just take some small subject some quick thing that may be a little elusive for people and just show you really quickly how to like get through you know some common hurdle that folks have in ds so uh brent you want to set us up for what uh, what we're talking about in this first one absolutely so um i noticed that on a lot of your uh, instructable videos you use some really cool hdris and i found out later that these are from free resources around the internet. Um, we've also experimented with creating custom HDRIs with a 360 camera, and this is actually pertinent to that. If somebody has, like, for example, a, a Ricoh Theta S or one of the other um, 360 cameras and you want to create your own HDRI, this is extremely relevant to that. Um, the great thing when you buy a set is that you load it in and the the uh, tracking of the HDRI is, it seems to be perfect, uh, but sometimes adjusting those locations for example where the the image is apart from rotating the image I always run into trouble when I do this and I figure perhaps I'm setting things up wrong when I import a raw HDRI and expect it to come in and look like it was meant for the camera to be sort of in the center of the stage okay okay well if you could go ahead and change your uh, your viewport to uh, an iRay preview and let's see what you've got and um if you if you have the link, if not, maybe we could look it up later and maybe put it in the comments or something with the video. Um, but uh, I know we were talking earlier about a uh, a particular HDR that I use a lot called Blue Grotto, that is a really really sweet image. Um, and I think you could probably just Google Blue Grotto HDRI and end up finding it. Um, yeah. So, uh, and this is just the 1K. It's not even the super high-res version that you have to pay for. This is the free version of this that you could find when you, when you go looking for it. Um, so, there's a number of things that I've done. Like, I actually have some presets that I've saved just using this. And there's a lot of cool things you could do with any HDR, HDRI using uh, tone mapping and things like that inside DS. So, um, is this your default load on this? Uh, it is okay. So you see, you see that it's all out of position. I've set my camera up for depth of field, but the uh, location and on the of the axis is all wrong. It seems to be tilted to the side, and I'm not in the center of the little pond area that you always seem to be in when you're doing your demos. Gotcha. Well, it looks to me like your camera probably has some tilt to it already, anyway. But um, let's uh, um, let's pop over to my screen for a second so I'm just gonna switch off and just so folks understand Brent and I are in two different locations and we're sharing our screens via Skype and capturing them uh, so you guys can see them so I'm gonna switch over and share my screen and load up the same character um, same figure that he has loaded we'll give that just a second to come in and then uh, I'm gonna apply the uh, I think maybe the same pose do you have uh, which which pose do you have applied to that I have the included pose with the meow. <laughs> uh, it is called um, flight down pose. Okay. And for those uh, curious about this figure, the meow is from a series, uh, a small series that we did uh, some time back called Impossible Creatures um, that is now being brought forward um, into Daz Studio. And uh, the meow was finished. Uh, in that series, there's also Boink, which is kind of this bat pig that's adorable, and the Chider, which is a really kind of, it's nightmarishly cute combination of a chipmunk and a spider. It's really funky, and I love it. Um, so, uh, and those will be available really soon um, through uh, through Renderosity and possibly through our store at CG Bytes. I'm not sure yet. Uh, if the DS versions of these are going to go there or not, but they might. But definitely, definitely going up at Renderosity. So here we have the the meow and the the same pose that Brent was using, and uh, I'm going to switch my view over to iRay, and I already have, as I mentioned, some presets saved um, using the Blue Grotto. And here on my screen, uh, you should be able to see those, um, see my my icons for those. You'll see ones labeled Blue Grotto Night. And there's some neat tricks I can show sometime, probably in another video, about how to use 
tone mapping to change HDR daylight images to images that look like they're at night. Um, so right now we're in the default DS uh, viewport with iRay and I'm going to go ahead and click on my Blue Grotto preset and you'll see that it is, like Brent said, it's very different uh, than what he had set up. So what I'm going to do is go over to my render settings and just kind of walk through some of the things that I have set up on that. Now the caveat here is whenever someone does an HDRI image to be used as a dome like this in 3D rendering, um, there's a lot of different measurements and things that come into play with that and so very rarely do you have any two HDRIs actually getting the exact same settings when you load them in so this is something you kinda need to get used to and get in the habit of working with um, so that you can adapt your uh, software whether it's DAS Studio or any software actually a lot of these things are ubiquitous to to almost every program that uses HDRIs as backdrops like this. So you want to kind of get in the habit of looking at these settings and, and feeling your way through them and you'll start to eventually pick up on little things about images and go, oh, that one's probably going to be like this, whereas that one is like this. Um, and and that's, those are things that come from experience. But, but here I'm just going to kind of take you through some of the stuff with this image and, and that way you can go download this image and have a touchstone for what I'm showing here and be able to compare for yourself and see that, that what I'm showing you works. So um, in DS, in the render settings, we're going to go straight down to environment, okay? And we want to have that set up, first off, at the very top, we want the environment mode to be set to dome and scene. Okay, what that's going to do, it's going to, um, it's going to extract lighting data based on the HDRI image and it's going to generate global lighting from that and then also by having it set to dome and scene you'll see that there's also a setting there for just dome only where the only light would come from your HDRI you want dome and scene so that if you use any kind of lights in the scene um, which would be li lights up here not mesh lights as people call them or emissives um, but you want to be able to, to still use these kind of lights too, these old school lights from time to time. They have their uses. So I use dome and scene, and then the dome mode is going to be a finite sphere with ground. Uh, you'll see here, if I open that drop down up, you'll see there are a number of different settings there. Uh, we want finite sphere with ground. That's going to give us the ability to make changes to that sphere and the ground plane that it, that it moves into the bottom of that sphere. So from there, um, there are a few different things to keep in mind. You can play with environment intensity and things like this, uh, which is going to affect like the brightness of the HDRI on the dome. Uh, environment intensity and environment map do similar things, but in different ways. And without a deeper explanation, just suffice that to say that for now. Um, I'm going to keep environment lighting resolution at 512. That's the default. Um, I'm not going to turn on environment lighting blur for this. So, <coughs> pardon me. So the biggest things to look at when you're trying to get your 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 HDRI dome kind of squared up or lined up uh, and scaled. Really, it's it's not so much alignment as much as it is always a, a matter of scale, because you never know how high off the ground the camera was that took the photo, and so we scale that dome until it looks right to some degree or another and there's a lot of ways that it, like if you're actually taking those photos you can get some exact information and know some exact numbers to plug in but if you're just downloading HDR eyes off the internet then uh, then it's going to be hit, and, hit or miss so uh, here I have my dome scale multiplier set to 20 so like if we're if we're working in units of I think DS works in I'm not sure. I think it has its own unit system, but it can adapt that to meters and feet or whatever. But whatever your units are, like right now our dome radius is set to 100, and it's multiplied by 20. So whatever the units are, it's basically you know uh, 2,000 of those units is the size of that dome right now. So if we were to change the multiplier, we're literally multiplying the scale of the dome. Whereas if we change that dome radius, that value is getting multiplied by the scale multiplier. Um, and really that is all something that again is just something that you kind of play around with like if I change that back to zero here you'll start to see we get something a little closer to what you saw from Brent there where the dome is tighter in um, and you're seeing like more of the rocks and things because the, the, 
the water surface that's in that image is actually made smaller because we've scaled the whole thing down. So if I take that back up, and this is just from trial and error of, of experimenting with this particular HDI that I like a lot. Um, if, if you look, you'll see that I've used this in a, a number of places. Um, I found that 20 expands that out to a pretty good size um, that, that tends to work for a lot of renders. <coughs> Pardon me. So a scale multiplier of 20 with a dome radius of 100, and most of the time, um, I'll just use the scale multiplier instead of even touching dome radius because the scale multiplier tends to to move things it's going to move things in a larger amount if you need to make a really fine adjustment then you go down here to the dome radius and, and work with that so uh, a couple other things to look at uh, you have dome origins and the interesting thing about these is you have to put astronomically huge numbers into these origins to get that dome to actually move anywhere at all so like uh, and and this might not even do it that's the other thing too is that these are directly affected by the scale of the dome so there we go I put in like you know 500,000 and it scoots you know so there I mean we're, we're barely moving that at all it's a really strange thing how those work uh, can that work in can that work in negatives by the way yes yeah, you can go positive or negative with that. Um, another little trick, <coughs> pardon me, another little trick that you can do inside here that I don't think a lot of folks realize is that all the parameters in the render menu work just like parameters on figures or props or anything like that. So they all have these little gears there and you can actually clamp a, uh, a tolerance of what that slider will do that makes it more interactive uh, with your hands when you actually slide it. So like right now that dome scale multiplier has no limits on it. If I open up those parameter settings and I turn on use limits and let's say that I want, right now I'm at 20, let's say I want my max size to be 30 and my minimum size to be a multiple of 1. Okay, well now that I've locked that off you'll see that the, the it, it's no longer grayed out and you'll see now when I slide that it moves incrementally. It moves much more, much more incrementally within that tolerance. Okay, so there it is up at 30. And then here, if I take it down to, let's just take it down to 1. So there you can see, I can just now, I can slide that, and I'm sliding it within the tolerances that I know, you know, that I know I want to tinker around within, that I want to experiment within. So, and then you could also set a, um, a default value like if I if I plug my default on that scale multiplier multiplier to 20 then anytime I make an adjustment if I want to return to that all I have to do is hit reset so that's really I noticed I noticed that mine beyond 20 it doesn't make much difference does that yeah. have to do yeah once once you scale it up so far it's it you're actually seeing so much of the the ground and the ground slope up into the dome that it starts to become um, like it really doesn't make any visual difference just by the law of, of, of like by how relative how it's relative to the camera how it's relative to the eye so it, it's it's really a strange thing to play around with honestly um, so the, the there's two other things that I would point out um, in looking at HDR HDRI domes and setting up HDR lighting um, like this um, the other things are going to be let's see let's look at uh, dome rotation Okay, so most HDRIs are based out of some kind of a dome, some kind of 360 degree photography that's going to have a light source of somewhere. It's going to probably have multiple light sources in it. Typically, one of those is going to be brighter than the others. That's going to be where your primary light source is coming from. And so you can rotate. If you just turn dome rotation, you'll see the imagery change and you'll also see your lighting change with that. Now, at the moment, you're not seeing the lighting actually change that much on the on the meow itself, and that's because there's a, a really important setting that Brent has heard me gripe about a lot. Headlamp! <laughs> is this, this, this stinking headlamp crap that's on cameras by default in DS. Okay, I get why it's there. It's, it's there as a way to illuminate things that you see in the viewport in the regular view, but when you're working with iRay, those those headlamps are are just damn dirty liars okay and um <laughs> so uh we always want to turn that auto headlamp to never 
all right and then you'll see now we're actually seeing the real HDR lighting interact with the creature so so that's incredibly important because you could be making all kinds of tweaks but if you have that headlight on you can't really tell if what you're doing is is true or not so you know and and like I said it's it's a liar those headlamps lie to you so much so now that we've turned the headlamp off we can we can move our dome rotation around and you'll see the lighting changes you'll see our environment changes all kinds of cool stuff happens with that so and and that's that's like some of the more powerful parts of working with HDRIs whether you've downloaded them or whether it's in a package you've bought from somewhere any of that stuff so it's it's super cool stuff um, the other thing that I wanted to talk about a little bit was the ground of course you know as I mentioned at the top um, the uh, we want our dome mode to finite sphere with ground uh, what that does is it adds a, a a sort of tapering ground plane that tapers into the uh, the dome itself at the bottom imagine you're taking a ball imagine you're taking a sphere and you're taking the very bottom of that and just pressing it flat right and then and you keep pressing it flat to one degree or another until it just is a flat little bottom that slopes up into a hemisphere Okay, that's essentially what this is doing. And then when you change the, gr the, uh, the ground texture scale, what you're actually doing is changing that basin of the inside of that hemisphere. You're changing the size of that basin. So if I take my ground texture scale, which right now is set to 100, I'm going to keep that as my default. I'm going to go ahead and lock some tolerances in here just so that uh, we get a, um, a range to work inside of. So if I raise that that ground texture scale now you can see I've blown it up super large so you can see it um, try to expand that texture out so far that it's going to start stretching up the uh, up the uh, the dome so we want to bring that down and let's let's actually go into our parameter settings and lock it to within zero and a range of let's say a range of 300 let's give it a little room to breathe there okay so now at a range of 300 you see it there and let's take it down to a range of like 12 something really tiny so there you can see a great example of you know kind of in practice what that ground texture scale does so in in calibrating your scene with an HDR HDR dome that you've downloaded from somewhere that you don't know the proper measurements for what you're going to be doing is working back and forth between the dome scale multiplier the dome radius and then uh, the ground texture scale those are the three primary values that you're going to be editing to get that that dome situated so that you get exactly what you need out of it both in terms of lighting and a backdrop image so that is that is really kind of it that's that's the thing that I wanted to go over in this and that we were talking about showing off tonight so here I'm taking that dome back to uh, a ground texture scale of you know 150 ish something like that and you can see there what we have and so, how would you how would you save that preset so you wouldn't have to redo that work okay, every time the, the way that I would save that um, here in my uh, my dad's 3d library under render presets um, this is just where I choose I mean you could save this stuff anywhere it's not like it's path specific um, but I choose to save this stuff under render presets there's a folder called IRA or I think I may have made a folder called IRA um, and then uh, you can see I've got a pile of different presets I use for all kinds of stuff and you just click on the plus sign and go to render settings preset and then let's call this blue grotto demo okay and then when that comes up you'll have the option to choose things from both the general renderer settings and the NVIDIA IRA render options so um, under general renderer um, I would uncheck dimensions because you, you can choose those for yourself as needed. I, I don't typically like to have the dimensions picked off in that stuff. Uh, destination, same thing. That's where files are going to output to. Miscellaneous, that's where you have that key setting of the auto headlamp. And we want that setting saved in there so that the next time we apply these settings, that headlamp business, that's, that's turned off. We don't have to think about it. So there's that. Then uh, under my NVIDIA iRay render options, I'm going to keep all of that at the moment the way they are, although I might tweak some stuff and save back over this because there are a few other settings uh, besides just the environment that I, that I tend to change. So I'm going to go ahead and save that. Um, and uh, 
the the other settings that I would typically change are going to be under filtering, um, and uh, filtering, then under progressive rendering. Those are the big ones. Under progressive rendering, I'm going to turn rendering quality enable to off, and then set my max time. I don't know. I like right. I had it set to 90. I'm going to set to like 300. So that's 300 seconds. It's not a long time, but it actually works really well for me. And then I'll crank all my samples up. Uh, and that's probably going to be it, unless I do any tone mapping, which I'm not right now. So, so those settings, and then let's just save over that one more time. Boom. So render settings, and blue grotto demo. Blue grotto demo. Where's my blue grotto demo? There it is. Yay. Blue grotto demo. And yes. So again, I want all my IRA settings to be saved. I'm going to go into my general renderer settings, go down to miscellaneous, and I want those. And we hit accept. So now we have that saved. That's awesome. So obviously, um, you know, render settings could be its own video because there's so far you can go with that. But um, oh yeah, the real power here is that you could spend an afternoon setting up, you know, half a dozen or a dozen uh, HDRIs that you like to work in, and then you, that work's already done. You just load it with a preset, yep. put your fig figure in, and you know you're off to the races. Yep, absolutely. Absolutely. It's really handy that way. And, and as you can see in my own library over here, I have a pile of these. And then where, where I use uh, the algorithmic substance designer and substance painter, the whole substance suite, those actually install into their program files a bunch of excellent, excellent HDRIs. And I just use those sometimes. I have presets that I've made for those that I use sometimes for product renders and all kinds of stuff like that. So, uh, and, uh, and it's also funny. Here's a little, a little sneaky little tidbit that, uh, that is kind of neat. If you have any video games installed, right, that have big outdoor environments, if you go looking, if you go poking around, if, if the files to those are anywhere that you can actually crack them open and look at them, there's a very good chance you'll find HDRIs inside there that just for your own artwork, not for anything commercial because that's, that's copyright and stuff, but for your own artwork, um, you could probably pull those in and use those too. I haven't experimented with it. I'm just kind of spitballing there, but it's kind of neat stuff. Um, because HDRIs, you actually, as you poke around inside different things, you find them laying around in funny places. That's an amazing. That's an amazing tip that we should totally put in another video. Oh yeah. I feel like I, I feel like I need a klaxon when we go past the ten minute. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, we're 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 good. I, I think that uh, we're probably what about twelve, thirteen minutes now. We're definitely over ten for sure. Uh, okay, cool. So, well, I I think we pretty much covered everything that we were talking about, and uh, so give you guys a look at setting up HDRI domes. Um, so, uh, this is, this is kind of the end. This is our first, uh, Daz Studio Teachables from 6S1. And, uh, you know, so I'm less, people call me 6S1. I actually prefer if they just call me less. 6S1 is the name of the studio. And, uh, and with me is, um, you know, my, my, my good buddy Brent. And, uh, so hope you guys will, uh, will come back and watch some more of these as we, uh, as we roll out, uh, more in this little series of quick videos. All right. Are we out? Are we clear? <laughs>